Okay, so we're now ready for the very final topic in the course, which is non-abelian gauge theory. This is a, a really surprisingly powerful generalization of uh, the basic ideas we discussed in the last lecture. In particular, um, this, this really forms a really important part of our most microscopic understanding of physics, or of the standard model. So now we're going to understand what exactly non-abelian gauge theory is, and how we can write down its action and calculate things in it. So to understand non-abelian gauge theories, we first have to understand the idea of non-abelian gauge invariance. Okay. So to do that, let me first um, say what we did previously in a sort of a more abstract way. Okay. So we discussed abelian gauge transformations. And those involve the following ingredients. An abelian gauge transformation was, you can think of as a map from space-time, where by space-time really, I really just meant r1 comma 3, just a normal flat Minkowski space. So a gauge transformation is a map from space-time to u1, okay, to the group u1. And this was uh, quite explicit in what we were doing because we always call the gauge transformation something like e to the i lambda x, right? This is an example of a gauge transformation. And then you can see that basically for every point x in space-time, we have associated some phase, in other words, an element of the group u1, okay? So this is what an abelian gauge transform was. It was a map from space-time to u1. Now to be uh, completely concrete, actually, for every field that we have in our abelian gauge theory, that transforms under the abelian gauge transformation. So for every field, for example, psi, we have to specify its charge. All right? And uh, you should really specify its charge as some number q. And q tells you how exactly the abelian gauge transformation acts on the field. So to be more precise, psi would transform in the following way. If you specify its charge, it transforms like that phase uh, raised to the power of the charge. Now, um, it, we actually only discussed the case q equals to 1, but it should be clear that you can do this for any value of the charge q. All right. So there's two bits of data here. You specify the group of gauge transformations, and you also specify how each field transforms under that group. Okay. All right. So now, given that, we can now generalize the whole thing to non-abelian case. So here we go. So first of all, I want everyone to consider a uh, compact, simple group uh, G. Okay, and G should be non-abelian, of course. That's the whole point of this. So for concreteness, uh, I'm going to take G um, to be SUN. Okay, this is just for concreteness. The construction is going to work for any group, but just uh, this will help keep the notation uh, somewhat manageable if I think of it as SUN. In fact, in my mind, I always have in mind SU2. Um, but you know, if your favorite group is SU19 or something like that, don't let me stop you. The construction will work for any G. Now. Um, Given a group G, I want to formulate a theory which is invariant under non-abelian gauge transformations where non-abelian gauge transformations, just as you might imagine from the above story, are maps from space-time to G. Okay. Such a map takes the form U of X, where here U belongs in the group G, and X associates with every point in space-time an element of G, which I'm going to call U. So this u of x is just a non-abelian version of this e to the i lambda x that we had previously. All right. So just to be clear, for every point in x, u of x belongs to g. Okay. 
Okay, so now I need to uh, review a little bit of group theory. This is all stuff that you did in Daniele's course earlier. But let me just review it now, since it may feel like group theory was many, many years ago. So I'm going to denote an abstract set of generators of the group G. by TA, capital TA, where here A runs over the Lie algebra of the group. Okay. So um, in particular, let me denote the dimension of the Lie algebra by D of G. Okay. Uh, let me write that slightly better d of g. Okay. So for example, what that means is d of say s u n is n squared minus 1. Now if you recall, the whole point of these generators is that they satisfy the following equation. The commutator of two generators, t a and t b, is i f a b c t c and the f a b c are structure constants. Totally anti-symmetric set of numbers, which are the structure constants of the Lie algebra. Next, let me remind you of the Bianchi identity. So the Bianchi identity is something that all operations obey. You can write it as the commutator of TA, TB, and TC, plus the commutator of TB, TC and TA plus the commutator of TC, TA and TB equals to zero. The cyclic sum over this particular combination of commutators is equal to zero. And you might recall you can check this just by expanding it out and making sure all the terms cancel. And they do. And um, this identity, together with the definition of the structure constants, actually gives you a relationship between each of the components of the structure constants, which is F, A, D, E. F B C D plus F B D E F C A D plus F C D E F A B D equals to zero. And this particular relationship between the structure constants is called the Jacobi identity. And these are all things that I believe you learned about in your group theory course. And if you don't quite remember them, you can verify them all again now quite easily. So now you might remember that there are many different representations of a group, right? There exist different group representations. In other words, the TA can be represented by many, by different sets of matrices, and each of them can be quite concrete. So in what follows, I'm going to denote the representation matrices in the fundamental, okay? So the actual matrices in the fundamental of SUN I'm going to denote those by little t a. Okay. Now in particular, because I'm going to be discussing SUN for most of this, Okay, I'm imagining that G is equal to SUN. If G is indeed SUN, then each of these TAs is, um, is an N by N matrix. Okay. And it's of course also true that the commutator of TA and TB equals to F, I, A, B, C, T, C. All right. So little t is the actual N by N matrix in the fundamental uh, representation. And capital T is an abstract representation. It could be anything. And finally, let me just remind you, for example, if we had SU2, if we had G equals to SU2, then A runs from 1 to 3. And each of these three matrices is, in fact, one of the poly matrices, a factor of half. Okay. 
So next, let's imagine a fermion psi So a fermion field psi of x who transforms in the fundamental of SUM. In other words, if u of x is in SUN, I want psi to transform in the following way. I want psi of x to go to psi prime of x, where psi prime of x is just u of x acting by matrix multiplication on the field psi. Okay. So note in particular that here psi then is an n component vector. So psi is an n component vector and the n components of it are rotated by this matrix u. Okay, it's an n component complex vector. Uh, psi is also a spinner. I'm suppressing the spinner index, but it also has a spinner index which transforms under Lorentz representations, under Lorentz transformations, sorry. So that means technically if psi is a direct fermion, it has four n different components. Okay, where n of them comes from the SUN-ness and the four of them comes from the spinner. Okay. All right, I'm suppressing all of that information here. In the notation, psi is just, uh, I'm just gonna write psi in this way, and this, this, um, all this information is implicit when I write down the vector field, when I write down the spinner field, psi. Okay, so now again, we can write down the Dirac Lagrangian for this field psi. And okay, what is the Lagrangian? S of psi and psi bar equals two integral d4x psi bar i d slash minus m psi. Okay. And um, is this invariant under this non-abelian gauge transformation? Well, let's let's look at what's happening. It's pretty clear that if we take psi of x to go to u of x psi of x, then well, psi bar of x goes to psi bar of x u dagger of x. And now if u is constant, in other words, if u doesn't depend on space-time, if u of x is constant, then it's invariant. But if u of x is not constant, then just like in the abelian case, the derivative term is going to mess everything up. Okay. So otherwise, the derivatives mess it up. Okay. So um, the solution is clear. Just like before, we now need to construct a non-abelian covariant derivative non-abelian gauge covariant derivative. Okay, so let's do that. So just like in the abelian case, the property that we want for the non-abelian covariant derivative is that the covariant derivative of the field psi should transform the same way as the field psi itself did. So in other words, if I take d, you know, d mu of psi, and transform everything, then this should transform with an overall factor of u of x. Okay. So this is the demand that we're going to make for our non-abelian gauge covariant derivative, and I'm going to call this equation star. Okay. Okay. So let's see what we need to make this happen. From the U1 case, it should be clear that we're going to need to introduce a new object to do this. So the new object we're going to be, we're going to introduce, is going to be our non-abelian gauge field. And that non-abelian gauge field is going to be A mu A of X. 
where A runs over the Lie algebra of the group. So notice the difference. In the abelian case, we only had a single gauge field A. In the non-abelian case, we have many gauge, non-abelian gauge fields A. We have as many of them as the dimension of the group. OK. And now, again, by analogy to the abelian case, we take the covariant derivative acting on psi to be d mu of psi equals to partial mu of psi minus i i g a mu a t a Okay, there's a little bit to unpack here. So first of all, this g here is just a number, okay? g is a number called the gauge coupling. We'll see in a little bit that this number g controls the strength of interaction in this non-abelian gauge theory. It's really analogous to the e that I introduced in the abelian case. The same thing, but it's conventional in the non-abelian case to call it g. Okay. Now the TA here are group representation matrices. Okay. They're in the fundamental. Remember lowercase t, little ta, with matrices that are in the fundamental representation. The reason they're in the fundamental is because psi is in the fundamental. And we'll come back to this point in a little bit. But that's why we have t in the fundamental here. If psi was not in the fundamental, you should put in there whatever the appropriate group representation matrix is. Okay. Okay. And that's the non-abelian gauge, that's a non-abelian gauge covariant derivative. Now let's see what property we need A to have in order to get my demand equation star here to work out. So I have d mu prime psi prime of x that is by definition equal to d mu partial mu a mu prime t a acting on u of x psi of x now let's work out all the terms here I have a term coming from the d mu acting on the u. I have a term from the d mu acting on the psi, product rule. And finally, I have a term coming from the matrix A acting on psi of x. Okay? And now, by equation star, which was, my, remember, my demand for how the whole thing should transform, I want this whole thing to be equal to u of x times the unprimed covariant derivative acting on psi of x. Okay. And again, just to remind you, this equation here, this demand, is the original demand that I made here. Okay. So going back, this is the thing I would like. Now, there's an interesting wrinkle here. This is not exactly the same as in the abelian case. And the reason why is that in the last line, this matrix U is on the left, whereas on the line before, the matrix U is on the right. And they're not the same because U doesn't commute with this thing TA. All right. So nevertheless, let's just solve for what we need A mu prime to be anyway. So equating the first, uh, equating the, the second to last line, the last one, cancelling things that cancel, what we find is we need that d mu u minus ig a mu prime ta 
times u equals to u times ig. Okay. So the u is on different sides of the ta here. So if we now solve for a mu a prime, what we get is that a mu a prime x ta equals to u of x a mu a of x ta plus i over g mu u dagger. This is the fundamental equation telling us how the non-abelian gauge field transforms. So now notice this was for a finite gauge transformation parameterized by u of x. Um, before going through this in any more detail, I also want to work out the um, what it means to work out um, the transformation under an infinitesimal gauge transformation. So to do this, um, to work that out, to do infinitesimal, What I do is I take u of x and I parameterize it as the exponential of i alpha a of x times t. Okay? So here these alpha a, this is a vector of gauge transformation parameters. And um, now, after I write it like this, I now work to first order in alpha a of x. Okay. So, for example, the fermion transformation law, psi goes to psi times psi goes to u times psi, just becomes psi of x is one plus i alpha a of x. Times ta acting on psi of x, and that's because I expanded the exponential to first order in alpha. Now, um, the gauge field transformation is a little bit more complicated, so um, to do that, I just take this guy here, and I plug in this expansion, and then expand everything out to first order. Uh, let me just do that for you explicitly. What do we have? we have here that a mu a times t a equals to u, which is the exponential of, we call this alpha b, t b, times a mu a of x t a, plus i of the g d mu, acting on u dagger, which is the exponential of i alpha c of x t c. Okay. And now I expand everything out to first order in alpha. What do I find? Well, to first order in alpha, there's a bit, this basically becomes 1 plus i alpha, and this becomes 1 minus i alpha. So first of all, the bit with all the 1s in it just becomes alpha mu a of x t a. Because there's one thing with 1 plus and one thing with 1 minus, that assembles itself eventually into a commutator. And finally, there's a piece coming from this one over here, which looks like 1 over g, d mu alpha c 
And again, this isn't clear, just uh, pause the video now and just do two or three lines of algebra to verify this. And now I can use the definition of the structure constants to take the commutator of these two things explicitly and write this as alpha mu a of x t of a minus alpha b of b of c t c a mu a plus one over t b mu alpha c. Now, if I uh, relabel some indices and uh, you know and, and collect a few terms, then what we find is that the infinitesimal components of the gauge field transform like this. They transform as delta a mu a prime, or rather delta a mu a equals to f a b c a mu b alpha c plus one over g delta nu alpha a. So this is the infinitesimal version of the non-abelian gauge transformation. Okay. So now we have these formulas. Let's now take a few seconds to discuss what is going on with these formulas. Okay. Okay. So um, first of all, first thing I want to point out is number one, the last term here, this guy right here, this looks like an abelian gauge transformation. Where GT stands for gauge transformation. And um, you know, I have uh, I have a gauge field and I shift it by the gradient of some number of some function. Okay. What about the first term? What does the first term here mean? The first term means something different. The first term means that the non-abelian gauge field points in a direction in group space. Okay. In other words, it has a Lie algebra index A. We should imagine that it points in a direction in group space. Okay. And um, the non-abelian gauge transformation is rotating the direction that it points in in group space. That's what this first term here is trying to tell you. I want to be a bit more precise about this. So more precisely, what's happening is that a mu a is trying to be in the adjoint representation. Okay. So let's remember what the adjoint representation is. The adjoint representation of a group is a special representation. It tells us um, how the elements of the group themselves transform. Okay. This is a special rep. So let me remind you, um, its dimension is the same as that of the Lie algebra. In other words, its dimension is the same as d of g. And what that means is that if, for example, phi is in the adjoint, I can write its components as phi a. Okay. So if we're in sun, again, a runs over n squared minus 1 values. And the way in which something in the adjoint transforms is the following. Phi a t a goes to phi prime a t a, which is u phi a t a u dagger, okay? Where, of course, u is my group element. u is an s u n. And you can view this operation as a, um, as a linear mapping on the components phi, 
you start with five, you rotate it by acting with u and u dagger on the two sides, and you end up with five prime. This is a linear mapping on the components of five. Now, note from my transformation of the gauge field, which is more obvious, I think, in this way of looking at it, that the gauge field almost transforms like this, right? There's a part of the gauge field which is exactly of that form, there's a u and a u dagger on either side, but it's spoiled by this non-homogeneous bit right here. Okay? So what that means is the gauge field is trying to be in the adjoint, but it's not quite working because it is, after all, a, a gauge field that has a special non-homogeneous transformation. And finally, the next point I want to make is that this form should actually make clear. You notice that we started this whole thing with some story about some field psi, which is in the fundamental. But notice that my equations telling you how the gauge field A transforms, they have no reference to psi. There's no psi in either of these things. Okay? Psi was just a sort of crutch that I introduced to, to make clear what the ideas were. So in fact, it's true that the transformation of the gauge fields the transformation of a mu a has nothing to do with the dimension of with the representation rather of the field it was acting on The fact that psi is in the fundamental really does not matter. Okay. In general, you will have all different fields in all different representations of the gauge group, but you will only have one non-abelian gauge field telling you how to differentiate all of them. So to emphasize this, let me compute the covariant derivative of a field in the adjoint. So I'm going to call my field in the adjoint phi a, the same phi a as above, and I want to compute its covariant derivative. So let me denote the representation matrices in the adjoint as T a. So T a of G is going to be the representation matrices in the adjoint. It's an exercise in group theory to convince yourself that given this transformation law, the components of the adjoint representation matrices are actually the structure constants themselves. Okay. Well, let me explain the notation a little bit. Here, A tells me which of the representation matrices I'm talking about, and B and C denote the row and the column of the matrix. Okay. So A runs over the different matrices, B and C tell me what the element of the matrix is, and that element in the special case where we're looking at the adjoint is itself the structure constant. Okay. So using this expression, what is the covariant derivative of a field in the adjoint? Well, remember, the covariant derivative is always partial derivative minus Ig A mu B times the representation matrix that is appropriate for the field that I'm acting on, which in this case is the adjoint representation matrix. Okay. And if you go through the indices, it looks like this. And now if I plug in this formula here, I find that this is equal to B phi A plus G F A B C. So this is the formula to take the covariant derivative of the field in the adjoint.
So in this way, from this idea, you can figure out what the covariant derivative of a field transforming under any representation of the gauge group is. Okay. And I encourage you to take a second and think about how that would work in other more complicated representations. And following, it's also so interesting to note that the, this whole thing really depends only on the properties of the Lie algebra, not on the Lie group. And finally, uh, one more notational note. So sometimes I'm just going to write a mu by itself with no superscript. And what that means is a mu with no superscript is the sum over all of the, um, all of the uh, components of a multiplied by the um, representation matrix. Okay. So in other words, this is a matrix valued vector field. because each component of it is this matrix. And if you want to be more intimidating, you can instead call it a Lie algebra valued one form. That's more precise. OK, that concludes our discussion of non-abelian gauge invariance. In the next video, we're going to figure out how to use this to actually build an action which is invariant, not an um, we're going to understand how to build a field strength, which is invariant under this, and then write down the dynamics of the non-abelian gauge field itself.